Let's begin Chapter 16, The Neurodevelopmental Disorders. These are disorders which begin in either childhood or adolescence. We'll begin our coverage with the intellectual developmental disorder, sometimes called intellectual uh, disabilities. It was formerly called mental retardation. Now, if you think if you're aghast at the word retardation, don't be. To retard just means to stunt or to slow. So we might talk about a retarded growth of uh, maybe an animal that wasn't fed properly, or a person for that matter. So it, originally, it had no slight, it had no negative connotation. It was scientific, but then children started calling developmentally disabled children, uh, forgive me for saying this, retards, and of course, that became a horrible slur. So again, originally it was not a slur. Now also consider the old archaic terms for levels of intellectual disability. They were also scientific, but took on a very different meaning. So nowadays, the only scientist who would use the terms would be probably referring to their uh, partner when they're less than pleased. See if you can guess some of these old archaic terms, which we would never use uh, unless very angry at someone we know probably all too well. So the terms that I'm alluding to were idiot, imbecile, and moron. And if you're curious in terms of which had the lowest IQ, which the highest, uh, idiot was the lowest IQ level, whereas moron would border uh, the normal intellectual range. Again, we don't use these terms. We'd probably use the DSM terms of mild, moderate, severe, and profound. Previous DSMs used to specify the exact numbers associated with each level. Apparently, the DSM has moved away from this, which spares you having to learn it. Uh, at the profound level, though, the person with the disorder is dependent for all aspects of daily care. They could not survive. Uh, indeed, they can't be left alone. On the opposite end, at the mind level, they can do most aspects of daily living, uh, probably work, uh, probably live independently. They would need help with more difficult things, such as uh, medical decisions, legal decisions. And if they were going to raise a family that is children, they would most likely need the help uh, in that area because the risk of neglect or abuse is much, much, much higher. So the IQ score is used to determine a person in the normal intellectual range from that of a person that has intellectual disability would be 70 or 69, depending on how you look at it. So 70 and above, begins the normal IQ range, uh, 69 and lower would be people that are intellectually challenged. There are three major areas of impairments. Conceptual, you might call that scholastic, if you will. Practical and uh, social. There's common comorbidities, uh, conditions again occurring with it, including cerebral palsy, uh, epilepsy, and autism. With intellectual developmental disorder or intellectual disability, if you will, 30 to 40% of the time, it's of unknown cause, which means 60 to 70% of the time, the cause would be known. So we'll focus on a couple of the most common causes. The common causes include Down syndrome and FASD. Take a moment and see if you know what FASD stands for. consider the FASD momentarily, but before then, let's focus on Downs. Now you can see there's two blanks and then there's one blank, so take a moment and see if you can figure out any of those blanks, and then we'll go on. So Down syndrome is also called trisomy 21, reflecting its cause. That cause being an extra 21st chromosome 
in all the cells of the body typically. So instead of having the typical 46 chromosomes per cell, they have an extra. In other words, they have 47. Uh, more is not always better. The biggest risk factor in non-genetic forms, and most forms are non-genetic, but the biggest risk factor is advanced maternal age. I'll give you an example. At 30, her risk is very small of having a Down syndrome baby, about one in a thousand. At 40, jumps to doing a little rounding here, one in eight, I'm sorry, one in a hundred. At 45 to 49, which is late for motherhood, but still, the risk jumps to one in 10 to one in 12. So you can see big risk factor is mom's age. Apparently not dad's age. His advanced age is more of a risk factor for autism spectrum, by the way, though. Now let's consider FASD. You thought, maybe you thought that FAS sounds like I see FAS in it, sounds like fetal alcohol syndrome. Well, close. So now we prefer to say fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And it's caused, well, prenatal alcohol exposure. Let's note some of the defining features of full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome, the severe end of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. One is you can see that the child's face is altered, not in terrible ways, but typical for fetal alcohol exposure. So the eyes further apart, the nose smaller, the gap between the nose and the upper lip, therefore bigger. The little vertical groove that just about everybody has between their lip and their nose missing, very thin upper lip. So one of the defining features is this face. Another de defining feature in full-blown FAS is intellectual disability, which would be lifelong. Another defining feature would be smaller size. Now, not dwarfism, but still smaller size, and the size of the individual does re remain somewhat petite as compared to what they should have achieved if they were not exposed to alcohol. They will, I should also mention, they will also have other malformations. So. If their ears were forming, it might be outer or inner ear uh, abnormalities. If their bones were forming, they might have skeletal anomalies. If mom was drinking a lot when their kidneys were forming, they might have defective kidneys, and so on. So you'll always get that constellation of low IQ, facial changes, and various malformations of the body. Sadly, all fully preventable. Let's now consider a disorder that you probably have not heard of, at least in its new name, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. That kind of summarizes what's going on, the inability to regulate moods. It was formerly, in the previous DSM, pediatric bipolar disorder, which was a really unfortunate term because it lacks the key features of adult bipolar disorder. The individuals are usually male, and you might be wondering, well, why the picture of the little girl there? Uh, she was the most irritable looking child I found on the internet, so she won. The person would have severe, the child would have severe temperament outbursts. This could be verbal uh, and or physical. They're consistently irritable, and the symptoms will appear before age 10. Let's consider autism spectrum disorders. Previously, we would just refer to the condition as autism, but the DSM-5, the current one, now calls it a spectrum disorder. I like to start by saying it is definitively, according to experimental evidence, not caused by shots. I have the picture of Charlie Sheehan on the right because he's a very uh, staunch uh, anti-vaxxer. So if you take your medical advice from Charlie Sheen, then maybe you should be very suspicious of autism being caused by shots. But if you want to put your faith in experimental evidence, uh, go with the concept that it's not caused by shots. There have been many large scale studies with tens of thousands of children in them. Some, their parents opted not to give shots. Some, their parents opted to give shots.
So if the shots were caused by autism, you would expect a significantly higher rate of autism in the group that had shots as compared to the children that did not. And yet there's only one study that found this particular outcome. It was later recalled by the journal and apparently the uh, author engaged in quite a bit of fraudulent uh, data creation and interpretation. So basically only one study found it and that study was recalled uh, both by the author and by the journal it was published in. And yet so many people believe that it's caused by shots. As of 2022, the most recent figures by the CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, estimates that one in 44 American children are somewhere on the spectrum at this point. Uh, surprising and shocking, uh, but that's what the statistics indicate. Let's look at key features. To me, the defining feature are the social deficits the social difficulties experienced by the person. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, that seems to combine quite a bit with uh, nonverbal communication. So standing too close, uh, perhaps answering questions, asking questions that are not appropriate, not knowing how to uh, initiate conversations, uh, all sorts of things related to verbal and nonverbal communication not recognizing when they're boring you or they're talking too much on a particular subject and so on. Virtually always present would be a high need for consistency. They are not uh, fond of change. They're creatures of habit. Their interests tend to be very narrow and very fixed. So they might know everything that there is to know on a, one very specific niche and they spend all their time with it and they want to talk to everybody about it uh, despite the other people's apparent boredom and so on. Altered responses to sensory information. So uh, being overly into sensory cues for uh, smelling everything that comes across their path. Uh, conversely, being overly sensitive. So normal sounds, even normal voices might be painful. Not in the DSM, but still worth mentioning, motor oddities, uh, such as uh, pill rolling with the fingers, incessant rocking, uh, stemming behaviors, if you're familiar with that term. IQ uh, can be anywhere from zero to uh, not right gifted. So there's no particular IQ that's associated with being on the spectrum. The next slide uh, shows some famous people that apparently are on the spectrum. See if you can recognize them. Unlike Down syndrome, autism does not appear to be related to the age of the mom, but some research does suggest it is associated with advanced age in the father. Individuals with mild autism have average or often above average IQs. Individuals uh, with severe autism are more likely to be profoundly or severely intellectually disabled. Savant abilities are very rare the movie Rain Man, starring Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise, is about a real-life individual that was a savant. He was severely autistic, unable to care for himself, and yet was gifted in many areas. Uh, if you ever saw the movie, he uh, memorized part of the phone book. That would be possible. He could look at a pile of toothpicks accidentally dropped on the floor and instantly, in one look, tell you there was 40-something toothpicks. Uh, you showed many of the gifts associated with uh, savant abilities. Most people think that all uh, strongly autistic people are savants, but in fact, it's very rare, even within the autistic community. Shown is just a very short list of people that uh, appear to be on the spectrum or were thought to have been on based on behavioral descriptions. Top left, Sir Isaac Newton. Below that, of course, Albert Einstein. I don't know if you're familiar with Daryl Hannah and Splash, Clan the Cave Bear and other movies, but also she uh, from the Conehead movie, the famous uh, comedian Dan Aykroyd, perhaps uh, Bill Gates, but many others such as famous inventors like Thomas Edison or uh, Tesla, also famous musicians 
including uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and quite possibly Beethoven. So a very short list of individuals, so clearly being on the spectrum is not a barrier to having a very successful life. Many people that would fit the criteria for autism spectrum in the DSM don't prefer that term. They prefer the term neurodiverse. So if you meet somebody who prefers the term neurodiverse, they're perfectly entitled to use the term that best fits their life and their experiences. So please honor their preference. If you learn, like to learn more what it's like to be on the spectrum, consider reading one of the books by the semi-local author. I consider the New England states to be semi-local. I was browsing in the cheap section of a bookstore and I saw the book on the left, Look Me in the Eye, and knew it had to be on autism. I read the cover and read the book, found it to be very interesting. Uh, he didn't learn that he was autistic until much later in life. Uh, he later wrote a book about raising his child, uh, nickname of Cubby, with his wife, who later also found out that she was on the spectrum. Very interesting book, uh, subtitled Adventures in Explosives, and uh, it was really it was an interesting book and adventure. His last book was called Switched On, and he's uh, on the board of many autistic societies, and he agreed to participate as a subject in a research study on autism using uh, TMS. Uh, take a moment and see if you can remember what TMS stands for. If you're thinking the M was magnetic, you're correct. The T is trans, the M is magnetic, and the S is stimulation. So in the study, they used TMS, and it had some unusual and unexpected results. He acquired the ability to understand body language, and it was a mixed blessing. He reviewed many of the conversations he had earlier in his life with other people and realized they were making fun of me. They were using me. His wife's severe depression, which he was aware of before, became so painful that his experience of her pain contributed to their divorce. So again, that ability to understand emotions was unexpected and again, a mixed blessing at best. The most recognized expert in autism would be Temple Grandin. I've read several books and I would recommend it. Whereas many people with severe autism are very low IQ, that is people on the severe end of it, she is both on the high end of autism and the high end of IQ, so she can really give us a unique understanding. Uh, she had a PhD in her particular area of study on animal thinking and animal behavior. Not everybody with autism uh, experiences life like she does, but consider this quote, I think in pictures. Words are like a second language to me. I translate both spoken and written words into full cover, color movies, complete with sounds, which run in my head like a VCR tape. I assume a lot of you have never even had a VCR tape in your hands just as well. When somebody speaks to me, his words are instantly translated to pictures. So most of us think in pictures. She does not, and not all people on the spectrum also think in a typical way. Again, neurodiverse. You should know that ADHD is the most common reason why children are referred to a mental health professional. Their behaviors are very similar to behaviors found in many children, but differ in their severity and the frequency of the symptoms. Let's see if you know the word qualitative versus quantitative. If the difference is qualitative, it has to do with the, the nature, the kind of its characteristics. And quantitative has to do with n just numerical differences quantity difference in other words. So which do you think this would be qualitative or quantitative? So since the differences are due to how much and how severe, that's quantity. So hopefully you said quantitative. 
children with ADHD have increased risk for both conduct disorder and before that, uh, oppositional defiant disorder. As teens and adults, they have a higher rate of car accidents. So if you're ADHD, you should know this, that you need to be particularly attentive. Parents, you need a greater insurance. Friends, perhaps you don't want them to drive, and so on. They change jobs more often than other people as a group. They have relationship changes more often than other people as a group. They're more likely to have drug experimentation or drug issues as compared to other children. So all these are potential problems, but not inevitable by any stretch of the imagination. Let's consider Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's had many versions of this name. Uh, previously, it was ADD slash H. Uh, in older days, it was minimal brain damage, or presumption, which uh, doesn't necessarily fit modern conceptualization. Let's look at the two main symptom groups. One has to do with in inattention, in other words, issues related to lack of attention. The other group related to hyperactivity and impulsivity. In terms of inattention, makes careless mistakes, can't keep focus, doesn't listen to the directions, or if does listen, doesn't follow them, dislikes putting in work, in other words, effort, and avoids mental effort. So for example, they're capable perhaps of doing the math homework, just not willing to put the work in to get it done. Disorganized slash loses things. For example, you find that your uh, child is failing something because the homework is not handed in, even though you've seen them do it. So you make sure the homework gets on the bus and they're still failing, the homework didn't get off the bus. They're still failing, the homework gets put in the desk and they just say, can't find it. So the disorganization uh, can be quite uh, bothersome to the people in their lives. In terms of the motor issues, fidgeting in the seat leaving the seat when inappropriate, always on the go, talking too much, often talking without a lot of content, and uh, interrupts other people or while other, all the other children are putting their hands up, they're blurting out the answers. Let's consider attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's had many versions of this name. Uh, previously, it was ADD slash H. Uh, in older days, it was minimal brain damage, or presumption, which uh, doesn't necessarily fit modern conceptualization. Let's look at the two main symptom groups. One has to do with in inattention, in other words, issues related to lack of attention. The other group related to hyperactivity and impulsivity. In terms of inattention, makes careless mistakes, can't keep focus, doesn't listen to the directions, or if does listen, doesn't follow them, dislikes putting in work, in other words, effort, and avoids mental effort. So for example, they're capable perhaps of doing the math homework, just not willing to put the work in to get it done. Disorganized slash loses things. For example, you find that your uh, child is failing something because the homework is not handed in, even though you've seen them do it. So you make sure the homework gets on the bus and they're still failing, the homework didn't get off the bus. They're still failing, the homework gets put in the desk and they just say, can't find it. So the disorganization uh, can be quite uh, bothersome to the people in their lives. In terms of the motor issues, fidgeting in the seat, leaving the seat when inappropriate, always on the go, talking too much, often talking without a lot of content, and uh, interrupts other people or while other, all the other children are putting their hands up, they're blurting out the answers. So let's consider treatment of ADHD. CBT therapy is particularly useful, such as the use of token economies. So in a token economy, the child or individual would earn a token every time they do a correct behavior. The token itself has no value, but later on it can be exchanged for something of value. The point is that they get immediate reinforcement. 
So perhaps they, if they earn five tokens, they can stay up an extra 15 minutes. In the old days, uh, it might be per, uh, permission to smoke an additional uh, cigarette in the smoking room in the older days. So, uh, token economies require work and everybody's got to be on the board from the teacher to the babysitter to the parents, but they can be highly effective and often can make drugs non-necessary or can be used successfully with medication. Teaching the child the use of self-instructions is also useful. I need to do this before I do that. I need to check my list every day when I get home. I have to check off every time I do the behavior on the list, what have you. So teaching the child the use of self-instructions can also be very useful. I'm sure you've heard of stimulant drugs like Ritalin, an older but useful drug, and then more useful version of it, Concerta, which has frequent, less frequent dosing, which is highly desirable. These are stimulant-based drugs, and certainly some of the stimulants on the market are some child's ADHD medication that their mom, their dad, a sibling, or maybe they themselves have sold. Non-stimulant medications are also out there, such as Stratera, which is an SNRI. Now we talked about SNRIs back in the mood chapter. Take a moment and see if you can remember those letters. So for SNRI, it's selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So it keeps more uh, norepinephrine in the brain of the child, or adult for that matter. Many individuals who were never diagnosed as a child when learning their ADHD as adults have found some of these med medications like Stratera to be very useful. I should mention that there is a considerable controversy over drugging children. Many children are on ADHD medication. And there can be all sorts of unwanted side effects from sleep issues. Well, that means they probably need it earlier in the day or different medication, anxiety issues, depression issues, growth stunning. Many side effects often can be avoided by, again, timing the medication at a different point in the day, smaller dose or a different medication or a lower dose. Anyway, uh, and many parents will search doctors until they find one that's willing to give them the medication they want. Now, the child could easily have ADHD, but sometimes poor parenting and stressful environments can produce similar symptoms. So it's really essential to see that the issues are related to uh, conditions that cannot be tweaked by just, say, modifying the home life. But in any case, throwing medications at children should be our secondary uh, response. Our first go-to should be therapy, especially CBT therapies like token economy. Let's consider the learning disabilities, now called specific learning disabilities. To be diagnosed with this, the ability in a specific area needs to be substantially below, quoted, uh, from those expected for their age, uh, specifically being in the bottom 7%. Specific areas include spelling, reading, uh, perhaps you've heard of dyslexia, that's our term for our reading one, writing, and math. There's a high comorbidity with ADHD. The individual cannot have intellectual developmental disorder. So if they're poor in multiple areas across the board due to lower intelligence, that's not a learning disability. A child with a learning disability has normal or maybe even above normal intelligence, but they have one specific area of functionality issues. The earlier they're treated, the better the outcomes. Untreated, the child often suffers from low self-esteem, stress, academic failure, risk of dropping out of school, all sorts of things. So again, earlier the treatment, the more successful that child will be. Let's consider oppositional defiant disorder. It's quite possible we've discussed this in an earlier chapter. If so, it should make your life a lot easier. I'd like to conceptualize it as normal teenage angst, but now at the level of pathological problems. So very negative very irritable, 
blames others. So it's the teacher's fault, my sibling's fault, my parents' fault. You get the idea. Pushes buttons, knows them, pushes them, enjoys doing so. Trouble with authority, particularly parents, but could be other authorities such as teachers. Loses temper, again, blames others for the loss of the temper. Vindictive, so borrows the item and intentionally loses it, breaks it, etc. Not a, a neurodevelopmental neural disorder uh, is actually a disruptive and impulse control disorder. It may go away on its own. It's more likely to need treatment. If untreated, it could go to the next disorder, which is a decided notch up. Let's consider it the next uh, step in line. If it's not successfully uh, treated or if it doesn't go away, quote unquote, on its own. Let's now consider conduct disorder. Again, we might have already covered this disorder when we covered the impulse and uh, disruptive disorders, if we covered that previously. Let's characterize it as being akin to juvenile antisocial personality disorder. It has virtually all the characteristics, though some things are specific because they're not allowable at that age. Often the person did have oppositional defiant disorder which was either untreated or not successfully treated and progressed to this condition. This person is a bully, which is just code for a person that's under 18 assaulting another person under age 18. Uh, they may harm animals, including torture and killing of them, vandalize for the sheer pleasure of it, running away, which is one of those things that's illegal specifically because of the age, which would be under 18, uh, prostitution, uh, sexual assaults, may intentionally set fires, probably thinks nothing of stealing, and uh, quite likely is to engage in drug use. If it is not treated successfully, the person has a high risk of going on to adulthood antisocial personality disorder. It's often, though not always, associated with problematic parenting. The person was often a PINS, uh, that is, has been put in contact with the court system because of their illegal behaviors and uh, is a person in need of supervision. Again, not a neural developmental disorder, but a disruptive and impulse control disorder category disorder, but still of childhood age, which is why I inserted it here.